Hello everyone and welcome to Chaotic Cast Meet the Players. Today Zero. we're interviewing Hunter. That's me. I'm doing the interview. This is Travis. Get to know the cast of the chaos. Here we go. So Hunter, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. How, how we all became friends and yeah, how we got this D&D group going. Well, a little bit about me. Um, I am 25 years old. Uh, I'm married. I have a kid. He's a year old. Just turned a year old last month, actually. Um, I love it to death. You know, it's great. I, I, I don't know how to explain, you know, being a parent and how great it feels, but, you know, it's just a blessing. Yeah. But uh, as far as getting to know, you know, how I got to know each other, each other me and Evan have known it long, each other for a long time. Um, we grew up for the most part together. Um, yeah, you guys have been friends basically your entire lives. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, I don't know, at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we talked about it a little bit when I was uh, interviewing you earlier, but uh, I met you through your wife because mm -hmm. uh, her and my now wife were uh, living together. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and Travis met that way. But it turns out, you know, that uh, Evan, his wife, is related to Travis's wife. So that's just like a weird yeah. little triangle going Small on there. World. It really is, yeah. Uh, and then Robert's wife used to work with our wives. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, so and it's just... So it's all we were all interconnected way before Dungeons & Dragons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we all love playing video games, reading books, fantasy stuff. And... Um, me and Evan were talking one night, and it was just, well, I don't know, that he was probably messaging you at the same time, but it was just like, the question came up, it's like, what if we play D&D? Would you ever want to play D&D? And I was like, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I'm down to give anything a try. Yeah. Just because I'm big into RPGs, like, you know, the Dragon Age and Mass Effect series, you know. Mm -hmm. Classics. Love them. Yeah. Bioware's great at telling a story. Um... But then, you know, and I told a little bit when Robert's interview, when we were hanging out just one time in our house because, you know, our wives are really good friends. We, you know, we'd all get together. You know, I'm Robert's friend. I don't just say that I know him through my wife. But mm -hmm. yeah. um, we were there and talking about games and board. I think we were playing board games that night. And Robert was like, you know what board game I'd like to play? Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, you know, I've never played it before. He's like, well... I know you all talk about me and Evan because he's heard me mention about Evan before. Mm -hmm. Said, you know, if you and Evan, you know, if you all ever play Dungeons and Dragons, let me know and I'll, I'm in. I'll play. Mm -hmm. And I swear it wasn't maybe a month later or two months later, Evan texted me that, and I was like, wow. I was like, well, I already know one other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's like, really? He's like, yeah. I, I know Robert. It's like, oh yeah, I know Robert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we all kind of knew each other before, but just the Dungeons and Dragons thing—it's really brought us together. Mm -hmm. And um, we've become even closer friends because of it. I think we message, you know, we talk daily. I mean, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it, we knew each other before and were friends before, but then it's just brought us closer together. Yeah, it's like a mutual hobby that we all just enjoy. And, and, and it's good because it's a hobby that brings people together, you know. So it, yeah. It just bolsters friendships. And as far as what it means to me, it, it's like a, it's, it's an escape, you know? And not that my life is terrible and awful that I need an escape from anything, but just to have a few hours, or you know, sometimes a little more than a few, but just to have that time to where I can, you know, not have to think about what I gotta do at work the next day, mm -hmm. or you know, what bills are due tomorrow, or yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And just get into the zone where I can just play and not have to think about all the crap going on in the world. Yeah, it's That's like, just great. You know? Kind of like a video game in a way, you know, you just turn your brain off and just get immersed in the world. It, it's like playing a video game, but a video game that you can get into with, you know, your best friends and all, you know, get together and tell the story instead of just me, you know, being the main character. Yeah, and, and do whatever you want and you're not limited by an uh, invisible wall, <laughs> yeah. you know, in a video game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what it is, man. Yeah, it's a great time. So, speaking of D&D... What type of characters are your favorite to play? Whether it be spellcasters, melee fighters, evil, good. What 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 attracts you to a player? To well, a, to, a to me, I 
I love like theory crafting different types of characters that mm -hmm. you know. I've done a lot. I've been thinking a lot about multi-classing. Mm -hmm. I know it. You know, some people shy away from it because you know, it's a little more difficult to do. Yeah, but it can get broken fast. I just love the way that characters can work together. Like different classes can work together. Like um, I think there's a really cool interaction you can have with a rogue ranger mm -hmm. if you go like a gloom stalker path with a ranger. Um, I think one of my favorite is probably the Paladin Warlock. Oh, yeah. Just because the Paladin is always this big brute with, you know, the high strength, high con, but they cast spells too, but Charisma's their modifier and they don't get to use it a whole lot because they have to worry about all their strength all the time. And if you go Warlock and the Hexblade, you know, path with the Warlock, then you can use your Charisma modifier. So then... You become this person that can hit really hard with a weapon because you can use your charisma modifier instead of your strength when you're attacking. Or you can also cast spells. And you, you got some spells that you get back on a short rest and some you get some extra ones with the paladin. Mm -hmm. And you can cast paladin spells to actually try and do damage with them. Instead of, you know, buff yourself or stuff like that, you can just do straight damage with them. Yeah. And I just like finding little interactions between classes like that. But for the most part, I think it's that hybrid of spell casting and... Uh, melee combat when you can find that good mix of being able to have the utility and stuff with magic to be able to do things maybe outside of combat or to use it to help your melee combat make it easier for you to do your job as a melee person yeah what we mentioned in my interview is that you know having that hybrid gives you the best of both worlds really yeah and that's stuff like I, the eldritch knight i think the eldritch knight is the first character i ever played so cool. And I didn't know a whole lot about it at the time, and I, you know, made some pretty dumb spell choices. But uh, looking back at it, you know, the Eldritch Knight's really strong. I think there's some. I would really love to dive into the College of Swords Bard. I think that could be really cool. And there's the with the Blade Dancer Wizard. Oh yeah, yeah, I've been wanting to check those out too. Those, uh, those all sound really cool, and you don't even have the multi-class for them, you know, they're just straight up subclasses, so. Yeah. It could be something that we visit in the future. Exactly. Uh, maybe in the next campaign. Yeah, the multi-class, I mean, you can get crazy with it. There's even classes that don't even share the same modifier, you can do some cool stuff with. Like yeah. we also mentioned in my interview, I played a one-shot where I played a, uh, I played a Barbarian Druid. Mm -hmm. Which you know they don't really share a lot of same stats, but just being beefy was my main goal. Yeah. So I mean, and then also I see all those extra hit points. Yeah. And the resistance. You can just do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, it's like you said, theory crafting. You can just get stupid with it. It's yeah. so fun. I mean, I just sit on my phone all the time. I'm like, oh man, if I did 14 levels in in ranger and then yeah. six levels in rogue, I'd get this and this. Or if I did, you know, if I did 12 in rogue and only eight in ranger and all this, it's just. Literally, when I'm at home sitting on my phone, I that's probably when I'm on D and D Beyond looking at different classes and stuff. Yeah, so. That's awesome. That is, I can, but hybrid spellcasters. I usually try and play, you know, not not necessarily lawful good, but a good character. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't enjoy being ruthless. You know, yeah. not paragon mm -hmm. usually. Yeah, it's hard to play evil characters when you have to work with the party. You know? It is. Um, you have to have I agree. To be in there. There's, there's, you have to get pretty creative if you're wanting to try and actually work with people that maybe have a good, you know, a good mm -hmm. alignment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where not necessarily having to define your character with an alignment is is good. Yeah. And I think Evan does a good job of just letting us play our character the way that we, you know, envision them, and not having to line them up under this, you know, yeah. this this certain column. Of yeah, you're awful good. So we can only do these, set, these yeah. certain things. But yeah, that's one of the best things about our game is that we just kind of alignment's not really that important. Yeah. We just do what the character's motivation would be. Right. And you know we're not playing murder hobos. We're just playing what feels right. Because there are certain situations in where you know maybe my character would be a little bit more ruthless because mm -hmm. of maybe the comp the uh, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but the just the series of events that led up to a certain situation. Um, they may be a little bit more ruthless or maybe a certain situation leads them to be, you know, a little more forgiving or generous depending on what happened. So you can't just always say, it's not black and white. There's always room for gray. Absolutely. 
So, <laughs> what's the better type of story that you enjoy, especially in a and d campaign? Do you like, you know, like a massive twist or a hero turn into a villain, vice versa, good guys, happy ending, love story? What, yeah. what, what do you like? Um, for me, me and Evan kind of talked about it a little bit when I was, you know, doing his little interview, but I'm into a little bit of anime and, you know, the classic Naruto. A lot of the villains in that are, they do such a good job of portraying these characters, these people, that their ideals, what they want to accomplish isn't inherently evil. Mm-hmm. But maybe the way they're going about it isn't the right way, or maybe it's they've got this character flaw that they couldn't overcome, and it caused them to do a certain way. But to me, it's I really would like I really like when a villain can maybe almost make you change your point of view, mm-hmm. like they have enough sense to what they're saying that it's like, wait a minute, you know. Am I the bad guy? Am I really the good guy? Are they really the bad guy here? And um, that I guess that's kind of what it is. Maybe, you know, like I said, things aren't always black and white. You know, maybe something happened to that villain or to that hero that changed him. But I think it's that. Just the villain making me change my point of view, I guess. Uh, Big twists are always great. Evan does a good job of of uh, putting these twists in there that you probably wouldn't expect. And uh, the small details. He pays a lot of attention to detail. Oh, yeah. And his he notes are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. But love all that stuff. I mean, it's all classic D&D tropes or whatever you want to call them, but ah, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, They're tropes for a reason because they work, you know, especially yeah, when done people well. like them. Yeah. I really like the callbacks that Evan does too to mm-hmm. previous campaigns. Absolutely. And I have to not... You know, I, I've been through two one-shots, two other campaigns. No, I'm sorry, three one-shots in this world that he's made. And then two other campaigns that he's made. So, you know, he might mention a character. I'm like, wait a minute, I know that name. Oh, yeah. oh that's that, that such and such. To that, today, and I didn't realize until after the session. Yeah. Yeah, he said yeah. the name, and I was like, I was looking through my notes like, where do I know that? Yeah. And, it was from and it's really cool the way that he's got these past campaigns and one shots affecting the world that we're in now. Because I think as of right now, we're playing the furthest, like this is the farthest the timeline has progressed mm-hmm. in the world that we are right now. We played some in the past that were older than the other stuff we knew, some that was in the middle. But now just seeing how all these things that we've done before affects the world we are in now is really cool to me. Yeah. Yeah, like we... we our first campaign was basically like the ancient heroes of this world and now we're yeah. seeing the after effects of what happened during that campaign and how it affected the world mm-hmm. which is really fun for us you know as a players to see all these callbacks and then for the audience to see this new stuff happening as it as we see it you know? yeah. there's, a, there's a good mix of both which is fun yeah yeah so you play violet amastasia yes yes yeah i do so uh what, what inspired your your creativity and your means for acting out your character? Well, I went through a couple different iterations with Violet. Um, originally, like first out, I was like, I'm going to play a Celestial Warlock. Like, I love this theme. I love everything that's going on with it. And um, I don't know. It just, the more I thought about what I wanted to do with Violet and how I wanted her to be like this person that wants to keep people from being hurt and is trying to protect people and is just digging for stuff, the warlock thing didn't work out. So I was like, well, maybe, maybe a warlock uh, paladin hybrid, you know, the multi class, which you know I've talked about before. And to me, it didn't make a whole lot of sense because you don't get that. Uh, the feature or whatever it is that lets you do your charisma modifier so yeah. I would have been spread p- pretty thin on my stats and I wouldn't have been able to focus on the different things I want to focus on because some stuff in Violet's backstory that's where I, I tried to base my proficiencies off of stuff 
in her backstory. So yeah. it called it for it to be in different stats. Like you'll learn that the the monastery where she uh, grew up and was trained and stuff, they're not just this these priests. They, you know, they go they're almost like archaeologists. I guess you could call them. They're looking for ancient relics and stuff, and so. History is a big thing. Arcana is a big thing for her, so she needs her intelligence. So having to spread all that out, I was like, no, the multi-classing, like that's not gonna work. And I was like, well, cleric, paladin, you can kind of do the same kind of stuff. I'm like, no. So it became just a cleric because you know clerics are so flexible with what they can do because they have this humongous spell list that they just have to pick stuff from, mm-hmm. and they don't necessarily have to be stuck with decisions that they've made. Yeah. And then I already knew. Kind of the patron. The, the theme has been the same with the fire and the radiant light. So it's always been close to Rhea and the patron that she chose. But then it just became... She's this, you know, grew up a farm girl. Um, so, you know, she's not real sophisticated. She did pick up some sophistication when she was at the monastery because it's a large place. And, you know, it's a nicer building and... Um, they have money there. So she picked up a few things there. That's why you'll see her asking for wine instead of beer and stuff sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily she doesn't want to drink. It's just that she doesn't like beer. Um, she likes wine. Yeah, she, um, she's got to taste the finer things just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, there's just, there was a lot of different things. Um, Violet, I don't know, the name came about. I was like, oh, Purple Eyes would be cool. And then I was reading some of the Warlock features, Warlock things, and I was like, one of them was your patron like marks you somehow, and they had listed off a bunch of different reasons. I was like, what if I changed one of your eye colors to gold? And I was like, okay, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, she can still do that as a cleric. I mean, there's nothing saying that I can't do that then. Do so, you want, um, cleared it with the DM. You know, he was cool with it. So we just ran with it. And then, you know, acting it out, like I said, um, she knows the simple things in life. So being in the places that she's been with the party so far, it's nothing out of the ordinary for her. So I would say she's acting pretty normal. It's not, you know... But, yeah. Yeah, she almost, do you feel like maybe she has like a level of naivety? Naive, naive Definitely, to, yeah. Like She's been kind of sheltered, I would almost say. Not a huge amount, but a lot of what she knows, like she knows a lot. She's smart, but it's not necessarily a lot from traveling, traveling around and, look, and learning these things. It's from reading them. And so having to find things out on her own is something that she's still trying to figure out. Yeah. That's something that's just fun to explore when you play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to switch topics 180 degrees here. Under me. Yeah. Uh, Turn around back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> D&D? Nope. We're going to talk about superheroes now. Superheroes. Everybody loves superheroes. Yeah. Who's your favorite superhero and why? Man. I'm, I know Robert's a huge comic book nerd. Oh, yeah. And I know you and Evan are big into the Marvel stuff. Yeah. And I like, you know, most of mine is just from the movies. And I've not seen all the movies. But I find it hard to not just love Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Yeah, dude. He was made for that role. He perfect for it. And I think that's why I I just, I like Iron Man a lot. And I like the character growth Mm -hmm. of him in in the movies. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I just have to say Iron Man. Yeah. And that's that's a really good answer too, because I feel like he's he started the whole thing out essentially. He was yeah, so I think he was probably the first yeah, movie. I'm pretty sure that was. Yeah. And then it's like even when his movies were over, you know, Iron Man three was a while ago. Mm-hmm. But still he's been in all the Avengers and other little side stories and stuff, like a little bit of Spider Man, but yeah. he still grows even though he's not a full fledged main character anymore. Right. You still get to see him just you grow. That's the cool thing about the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm. But Iron Man definitely he's just took on a journey that's just yeah. I can see why it'd be anybody's favorite. I can say, I'll say, I'll split it. I don't watch a whole lot of Marvel, but I really like the Wonder Woman movies. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Wonder Woman's pretty cool. Yeah. Bring in a DC character. DC. Know. We'll do a DC and a Marvel, yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I like that answer. Yeah. 
Now, Wonder Woman's pretty sweet too. I don't know a lot about her because I like I said. I don't either. I'm well, big into like Greek mythology and stuff. Yeah. And I, like, she's Amazon, yeah. I guess. But it's still that same kind of thing. Yeah, I like Greek related. mythology, North myth- mythology, sorry. Mm-hmm. And then get down to that Amazonian type stuff, which reminds me a lot of mythology. So that's where I kind of go with that. I like uh, the old Justice League cartoon where she had the invisible jet. Yes. That's the only thing I knew about her. Like, well, how does that work? Just sit. What if she loses it? <laughs> yeah, how does she find that thing? She's just that good. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's say, what's, what's your favorite book? Book series. Book series, for me, um, right off the top of my head, the Aragon series. It's awesome. I love it. It was probably my first introduction into, like, fantasy, mm-hmm. like, novels. Yeah. And, um, me and Evan were talking about it. That was a lot of what meant, brought mine and Evan's friendship closer because we would go back and forth with these books. He would read them, I would read them. Um, then we would talk about what we thought was going on, you know, what happened and stuff. But Aragon, it's just such, I don't know. Christopher Paolini, he was really young when he wrote it and he did such a good job of forming these bonds between characters and developing them over the series of books. And it's there's different bonds. There's the bond of you know Aragon and Sephira, his dragon, and it's just it's a it's almost weird because it's almost like he raised her, but then she almost is like this motherly figure to him. Mm-hmm. But but then as Aragon gets a little older, it's almost like a sister brother sister thing because they kind of bicker back and forth. But, you know, the love is always there. They care so much for each other. And then you've got Aragon and Roran, his brother. I think it's his brother. Lord, it's my favorite book series. I can't remember the lore to. Yeah. I can't um, help you on that right now. I, anyway, Aragon and Roran, awesome. I want to think that they're cousins now that I'm thinking about it. Mm. Definitely that's what it is. They have a brotherly relationship. But they, it's definitely a brotherly relationship. Yeah. And Roran's this older brother who has watched over Aragon, and then um, Aragon all of a sudden becomes this this more important person and this more powerful person, and it shows Roran's, um, he wants to help Aragon and the journey that he takes to get there and be able to do that and the growth that he makes as a character. Mm-hmm. And then you've got, you know, Aragon and his love interest and Arya and... There's just just so many different things, and it's great. I just yeah, I love it. But recently, I read the uh, the Riria Chronicles. I've been reading all the Riria books, yeah. and I really love those. That's when I got to get on like Chronicles. They're awesome. Yeah. Um, one of my f- I was gonna base my first D and D character off of one of the characters, Hadrian, uh, one of the main characters, but ended up not happening. I just couldn't figure out the logistics of it. But anyway. Yeah, love it. Love those books. They're awesome. There's a really good dynamic. Usually when books jump around, I f- like they'll jump between, you know, these guys are doing this, and here's a couple of chapters about that. And this person's over here doing this, here's a couple of chapters about that. To me, in books like that, to me, I usually get kind of bored. Mm-hmm. I pick my favorite yeah, little sucks, thing. Yeah, it, it sucks when they move to and then you, you don't like. Yeah, and it's like something's going on that you love, and then all of a sudden you're shifted to this other thing, and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, man. But with these books, it does that a lot, but I just, maybe not so much in the beginning, but once I got into like the second or third book of the uh, Riri Revelations, it, I got to where every time it would switch, I'd be like, oh yeah, I, what's going on here? I, I want to read this. And so the, all of the characters in that world, you know, that it follows are really, really interesting and deep on different levels. And yeah. I, I just really like those books. And obviously there's the relationship between uh, Royce and Hadrian, which is, they're they're both thieves, but they're these noble thieves, which is a really admirable thing, but they have different beliefs, different moral codes, and one of, they're each trying to influence the other, giving each other their better tendencies, and, you know, because Hadrian's kind of naive when it comes to stuff, so Royce is trying to make him see the world, but... Royce is kind of merciless, and Hadrian's trying to soft him up a little bit. So, yeah. it's a cool interaction between those two. I've heard a re- reviews for that series calls Hadrian and Royce like the one of the best duos in fantasy fiction, and I'm like, I gotta read this. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Man. Yeah. I really think they're really cool to watch, and 
I don't know. They're just badasses. <laughs> it's really cool. Awesome. But yeah, I eventually at some point I would love to do uh, a character based off of them. I just have to figure out the logistics of it. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm sure, especially as more stuff comes out, it'll be easier and easier to do. Yeah. 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 But other books that, um, see there's The Written. I've read a couple books of them. I haven't finished the series yet. It's really good. Really good magic combat. It's got that flow of melee and spell mm -hmm. together, which is really like that a lot. Yep. So there's a couple different things, but it's all high fantasy stuff. Yeah, that's my but favorite as well. Yeah. Definitely Aragon. Got me into fantasy, and I always reference back to it whenever I think of anything about yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's just like a really good series to start out. Anybody, if they want to read fantasy, it's like, we'll try out Aragon. It's not hard to read. Yeah. There's some twists and turns, but nothing that you would miss. Yeah, like it's all out there. Mm -hmm. So, but they're good, and you don't really expect them. But it's not hard to pick up on. I think that I read, and I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm pretty sure Christopher Paolini mm -hmm. self-published that first Aragon novel because he couldn't get anybody to pick it up or something. I believe you're right, yeah, and it and became it was, a bestseller. Yeah, I mean, it's just, that shows what a good story it is when someone takes a self-published, which are like pretty much never succeed because mm -hmm. they don't have the backing. Mm -hmm. And still yeah. does. That then, shows the next two books after that, I mean, they were probably double the length, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. people really liked them. And then the last book was really good. I think I read it and uh, it was six or 700 pages. And I want to think that I read it in like a day or two. Yeah. I was so sucked in. I was up until like three in the morning every night reading. Yeah, it's a good book right there. But yeah, uh, I wasn't as happy with the ending. I thought it could have went different ways, but um, it wasn't so bad of an ending that it ruined the whole series for me. Yeah. Uh, still worth seeing. Still worth going to watch it. I'd still or still worth reading. Mm -hmm. um, I I think they could. They came out with a movie. It wasn't very good. Yeah, I've seen the movie. That's about all I know about Aragon. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't base anything. Yeah, that's, that's what I've been it's, uh, told. It's probably about fifty percent of the book. But <laughs> yeah. Um, they could do a really cool movie series about it, but I guess they never. Maybe will. one day. There's all kinds of Maybe adaptions one. coming out lately. I mean, I could cast it for him. I've already yeah. got people in mind. Well, speaking of casting, <laughs> what about your favorite movie or movie series? Favorite movie or movie series? Okay, so these other guys are all big superhero, superhero things. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of lean toward the horror, scary stuff. Ooh, okay. Um, I really love. I want to say Quiet Place, the first one. Yeah, I haven't good. seen the second one yet. I really want to. Yeah. I just haven't gotten around to it. But the first one is amazing. The acting in it is so... John Krasinski does an amazing job. Mm -hmm. He directed it and, you know, his wife was in it, which I'm sure is a challenge. But yeah, <laughs> for reasons. But yeah, but... Um, <laughs> They do such a good job. They they do so well together. And just the amount of... Because they don't... I mean, there's barely any words in the movie. But the acting, of just like the physical acting, is really good. And, mm -hmm. you know, they learn sign language, which I think is cool. They use a lot of ASL. Um, but I really love The Quiet Place. Um, another movie I'm a big fan of is Passengers. Uh, with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. Okay. Um, oh yeah, that's a sci-fi movie. Right? It's yeah, sci-fi. I really like. I'm that. big into sci-fi stuff. I love space. Yes. Um, Give me a lot of kind of Mass Effect e vibes. Mm. Not not as much high fiction, but um, yeah, it's really cool. It's really intense. It, you have a lot of emotions throughout the whole thing. It's crazy to watch what Chris Pratt goes through. I don't want to spoil too much, but. He's basically alone on this ship that's got a bunch of people on it, but he can't talk to any of them. He's by himself, and he knows how long he's going to be by himself, and it kind of drives him crazy a little bit, mm -hmm. and it makes him do some pretty crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's really cool. I got three movie recommendations for you since you like horror and that sci-fi. <laughs> you might have seen all three of these. Yeah. Uh, first is Pandorum. You ever heard of that one? Pandorum. That's a sci-fi horror movie. Not really that good, but I mean, it's it's good, but it didn't get good reviews. Yeah. But it's a really cool concept. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows Alien, like the number one horror sci-fi. But yeah. this one's pretty good. And uh, Sunshine, have you ever seen that? I haven't seen that. That's, a, that's another good horror kind of like mm -hmm. horror sci-fi. And Event Horizon, have you ever seen that? 
That sounds so familiar. Yeah, that's the one where they like they go in this goes in like themes of like devils and it's also sci-fi and it's set on a spaceship, but that sounds it's really like familiar. A, I don't remember. Portal to but... Hell, basically. Okay. Yeah, super good. So, I think it's good. You like scary? I mean, scary stuff. Yeah. Is that on your radar? Oh, yeah. Have you seen one of the best scary movies? Mm-hmm. If we're talking about just like freaking you out, making you think about stuff. As above, so below is an amazing yeah. scary movie. I, I like it. I don't know how good the reviews on it were, yeah. but it's kind of got that like uh, Blair Witch thing mm-hmm. where they follow you around with the camera. Mm-hmm. But some of the stuff in it, the things in it are really cool. I yeah. like it. I think it's a really good scary movie. It's I don't get scared very easily on those movies, and that one kind of freaked me out a little bit. I'll check that one out. See, I like the ones that are like existential dread, and it's not more jump scares. It's more just like the setting is so creepy that it just mm-hmm. builds and builds. Yeah. Like, have you ever seen uh, The Witch? Yes. That's a, that's one I feel like it's kind of a scary atmosphere. Yeah. Just like every moment you're like waiting yeah. for something to happen, but nothing. It just it just builds. Yeah. And then also like uh, It Follows. Have you ever seen that one? I haven't seen that one. That, that's a pretty good one. That's you got suspense at all times. You know, this chick is never safe. Mm, and okay. it, but it's, it's not like stuff doesn't pop out of you she just like this creature takes possession of well she can only see it and mm-hmm. it's like an, it's basically an allegory for STDs okay. is that this creature comes after this person and the only way can, you can pass the creature on to somebody else is by having sex with them <laughs> <laughs> so she gets caught in this chain and she has to figure out how to stop this thing and it's like an unstoppable monster that just takes the form of a person and yeah. only she can see it so her friends are helping her, but they can't see what's coming after her. And she's just in her bedroom, and like this big lanky dude comes out and just comes after her, and it, oh, wow. it never stops following her, no matter where she goes. It's just slowly walking towards her. So that's, you're always on the run. That's and crazy. it really builds a good suspense. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, that's a good one. I think uh, it was on Netflix. The Descent. I don't know if you've ever watched oh, The yeah. Descent. The Descents yeah, are super good. Both yeah, of them. I like both of them pretty well. I need to watch um, the second one. The Descent 2. I don't think it's as good as the first one. Yeah, the, the first, first Descent. Is man, amazing. that happens pretty good. The original. Claustrophobic atmosphere for sure. Claustrophobic. I can't believe There's a lot of that in As Above So Below too because yeah. they're like down in the crypts. Oh like yeah. Yeah, below. yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I'm awesome. not a, I am not i do not like tight spaces like that. So nah. Yeah, that's that's horror inducing for sure. So back to D and D then. Okay. Uh a lot of spells in D and D. A lot of spells. What if you could pick a spell to have it use it well in your human life, in real life, what what spell would you pick? Well, We've talked about this. Yes, we have. Uh, we'll even go the cheat answer. And the I'm not going to go with the old <laughs> cheap uh, wish answer. <laughs> it's too easy. It is easy. It's too easy, almost. I would say um, probably the teleport spell. Oh, that's a good one. Just because you know, I love to travel. I say I love to travel. I've not been a whole lot of places, but the places I, you know, I want to go places. Yeah. And um, you know, you teleport anywhere you wanted to go. Man, I didn't think about that. That would be mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, teleport. You know, it's awesome. There's, I mean, it. You know, being able to fly would be cool and fun, mm-hmm. but flying is really just another means of transportation. Why like, can't just teleport? Yeah, exactly. So. And then, like flying, you never really think about if we're gonna get realistic with it in real life. You know, you can fly fine, but then like you got wind resistance hitting you it's probably yeah. freezing cold uh-huh. bugs hitting your face <laughs> i mean how great is flying really right. probably not that great right i mean there's always the invisibility thing but that is kind of yeah that would lead to I, I mean i wouldn't use that in everyday life you know it'd be cool to be a super super uh like superhero with invisibility yeah but in everyday life i mean it has to be teleported yeah that's a really good answer I like that one so for violet Yes. What what are your ambitions for for Violet or for the, the group that she's found herself with or you know if your ambitions are different than her herself like what what would Hunter want her to do or what would Violet want? Hunter wants Violet to. Violet's got a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. She knows a lot about you know history and magic, Arcana ish things. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of stuff about herself that she is still trying to figure out. Um, like we talked about before, a little bit of the naivety. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, trying to, you know, figure out, grow up, be, become a little more mature. Um, 
for Violet. I want her to be able to help her friends keep her friends alive because she doesn't want to have to go through something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but for Violet, I think Violet wants to help the order that she's in as much as possible and continue to move up because she feels like she has this purpose to be there. I mean, she was, at a young age, she was chosen to go to the monastery and uh, has been trained up um, trained up there by all the various mothers and sisters that work there. But, um, yeah, I mean, just moving forward with the, the agenda of the monastery that she's in. All, that's just based off the knowledge she knows now. Um, but Hunter wants her to just, you know, grow up, be mature, and, you know, um, I guess become more powerful. Who doesn't want that? Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody wants their character to be a badass. Oh, yeah. It's but really easy. I want to be the person that can turn the tide of a fight. I think, you know, also with one spell, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's a, 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 a clutch heal or yes. a, you know, uh, a banishment at a key time or whatever it is that can turn the top of five, but just want her to, you know, be impactful. Yeah. Because, you know, your all's character is really strong and you've got that crazy ass reach. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, we all got some kind of gimmick, but I, I'm, I'm excited to see Violet grow in power because the cleric spell in this is just so versatile. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm excited for those clutch moments, like, both in character and out, just to see what kind of crazy stuff she can do. And I feel like the class that I've went with her, you know, the mm-hmm. cleric, and then this the subclass, the the uh, the light subclass, uh, really opens up that opportunity to be more more of a damage dealing cleric, but trying to keep that balance of helping keep everybody alive, whether that's healing you or killing the people that are trying to kill you. Mm-hmm. So. You know, I get access to like fireball and wall of fire and stuff like oh. that. So, oh, yeah. eventually, that'll be fun to see how see how things work out. Yeah, so she she can heal and she can kill. Heal and kill, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Sometimes the best medicine is the bullet. There you go. Yeah. Right. So sometimes the best medicine is the fireball. Yeah. <laughs> in the D&D terms. Yeah, yeah. Like without with being very vague, so we don't spoil anything. But like the session we played today where uh, we had a, a, like an urgent goal. Kraloff has a goal he has to work towards and it's mm-hmm. time sensitive. So, you know, he's going to do that no matter what. And Violet agreed to go because it's just like, he, he didn't really know her that well, but she agreed to help because that's like her sense of duty. And, and yeah. she wants, uh, like Kraloff was like, thank goodness because she's so, <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I didn't want to make her go, but thank God she's going. I mean, it's, you know, we are playing D to get D yeah. and D together, so it's, it's you want to keep the party together. But I feel like Viola would want to go help because some of the things in the world of Manola, um, half elves were very oppressed mm-hmm. early in early in the world. And um, Evans kind of talked to me about you know the history of half elves and what has went on, and part of um, without telling too much, part of the lineage of Violet's, you know, family, her past generations, were key players in the uh, the liberation of the half elves and their land. So, um, when she heard that bugbears were taken on a slave ship, mm-hmm. that kind of sparked something in her. It's like that's not right. I need to do something about that. And so it made it easier to say, all right, I can put my thing on the back burner because mm-hmm. if they get where they're going on this slave ship, who knows how hard it's yeah. going to be to find them or mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Um, you know, Violet mentioned a little bit that her order looks for, they're basically um, archaeologists. Um, they are after these ancient relics and it's not so much to take them and use them for something. It's to take them and protect the world from other people maybe trying to use them. Uh, or maybe just to take them and categorize them in history, you know, where they belong. Keep them in like a museum, I would almost say. Uh, so really like an archaeologist. Like Indiana Jones, like, this belongs in a museum. Yeah, you yeah. belong in a museum. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, obviously the power that comes with those ancient relics is a plus. And I think that might be part of the reason that the order that she's in has prospered as well as they have. But at the same time, I feel like they're doing the right thing because of 
the the enemies that she has encountered so far seem to be very evil, at least with the information that I have. So that leads me to believe that maybe we're doing something right. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm excited to see like with her backstory just where things go. You know, it's gonna yeah. be really interesting to see play out. So looking forward to it. Oh yeah, can't wait. Can't wait to see what Evan's got in store because I kind of gave him, yeah. I gave him this idea of what I wanted, and it came. I kind of let him take the reins on where it ended. Yeah, I feel like that's how we did most of our characters. Like we told him what we wanted to do, and he's like, "All right, this is how it's going to work in this world." Yeah. And it's fun as a player to see. You know, it's kind of like a co-writing a character. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like it's as much of a surprise for us as it is for him. Yeah. You know? And, and for the I mean, that's the way it is when you're you know writing this thing. You don't want to know where you end up. Yeah. Because. What fun would that be? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, D&D &D people write, like, 50-page character yeah. backstory, and they know exactly My character yeah. killed a dragon at level yeah, one, like, and yeah. Yeah. led this army into battle. It's like, really? You have eight hit points. Yeah. <laughs> the way we did it, it, it worked out good. It's like a good balance. Yeah. Yeah, between player and DM creation. That's the point of D&D is to cover out a story, you know? So mm -hmm. That's the fun part. So, you know, speaking of the world of Manola, mm -hmm. since this is, we're kind of veterans of this world by now, Evan's spent so much time in this world it's just so fleshed out at this point I mean this is the third campaign yeah done one shots you know we played a lot in this world what what would you say is like one of your favorite parts about the world um we touched on a little before I think about how the old stories affect the new mm -hmm. world that we're in yes but you know that's awesome and that's probably my favorite thing but to add something new some of the stuff that Evan's come up with um we saw something in it today that was pretty cool. I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah. But I don't want to spoil too much about it. Plot but, books. Yeah. Just like, we're going to go do something. Here's something else. Like, uh, um, there's these, all these, he comes up with these amazing, like, artifacts and stories that draw you in. And you, the lore is just so deep. I don't know how he's done it. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. And I've known him for a long time, and it's just, it's crazy. You know, you'll ask him a question, and he'll ha he's got an answer on what it is. Like, why is this city, you know, called this, or you know, why is this, you know, lake right here? And he's like, well, it's this, 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 mm -hmm. and just you know, the deep lore is great. Um, if I had to pick one thing, that I thought was really cool is in the very first campaign that we played in Manola, he had this crazy ass. I think it was a gnome. Maybe it was, a, it was a gnome or a dwarf. I can't remember. I'm not being racist. Not just because they're short. <laughs> <laughs> they're, I, I they're literally can't similar. remember. I want to think it was a gnome because um, he the, built the this. Blaster bolt guy? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a gnome. A gnome. Um, he, uh, he built this thing that you could like travel across the continent by using electrical energy and stuff. And I thought that was really cool in a, a creative way. To get us a bunch of melee characters who didn't have a whole lot of magic to be able to fast travel. Yeah, how and we got that campaign to work? Just a bunch of melee characters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we were a bunch of, it was a barbarian, a fighter, and a rogue. So. Ma magic light as possible. Yeah, I mean, I had a few spells. I was, the, like I said, Eldritch Knight before. Yeah, but damage dealing, you know, it's not like. Oh, yeah, I mean, I didn't have any just... utility. I think the only utility I had was. What, I think I might have had whole person. Yeah. And I never used it because I was like, I'd rather use Scorching Ray. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I'd rather use I'd rather just use Booming Blade in him with my sword or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, that was a really cool thing. Um, and the way he's incorporated all the races in the world to mm -hmm. different regions, like it would be in normal life. And if we think about, you know, the different races of characters, um, that you play, gnomes, dwarves, half elves, whatever, basically being the races like they are in the world, you know? You yeah, know. like nothing's off the limits. And he makes it work. Like one character, one guy we played with played a Loxodon, big elephant. Yeah. I was like, there's no way it's gonna fit in the world. It's not gonna let that happen. But he's like, I'm gonna make it work. And yeah. he did, and it's cool. Yeah, and I, we had a Warforged and a one shot one time. We had, you know, and he's like, oh, well, the Warforged is from this because of this. I'm like, yeah. well, that's cool. I'm like, 
I want to be a Leonin. You know, Leonin's, it's a race, but it's not super common. It's like, yeah. well, they're either here in this jungle or out here in these plains because they grew up and did this and this. And whichever way you decide is whether you're in the jungle or this. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, well, at least you know. I'll, I'll play along. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one part I like, too, is just the regions. And yeah. You can, anything can work because he's got it fleshed out so well. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. So... Final question. Yes. Now that we're playing for an audience, what what do you think the viewers in the audience, you know, what do you want to impart to them? What do they mean to you? The audience to me is I don't I don't feel like we are I don't feel like the audience is doing us a service by watching our video. I think it's the opposite, you know. I think what we're doing is providing them a means of, you know, entertainment. It's not always entertaining. I mean, maybe it's not entertaining to some people. Maybe they just come for the laughs. Maybe they come to get ideas for Mm -hmm. their own campaigns or characters. Or maybe somebody's coming to, uh, maybe they're new to D&D and they're, you know, watching to try and figure out the rules. You know, we're not the greatest at rules. Yeah, we figure out we, yeah, we figure it out as we go. Um, but I think the main thing um, is it's just like this this escape. Like it is for us when we play. It's this escape from uh, all the stuff that's going on in the outside world that hopefully when people are watching it, they can kind of forget about all this crap going on outside. Mm-hmm. Whether it's you know, you know wars and stuff that are going on that may impact you, may not, but or other things... Uh, you know, I don't want to throw something out there and go into detail about it because I don't know what everybody's going through. But uh, just escape from all the news and stuff that you see on the TV all the time. If you can come in and listen to some, you know, a bunch of guys playing this fantasy world that has nothing to do with the real world going on outside, then I think we've kind of done our part. Uh, If it helps one person, makes their day a little bit better when they listen to it, that's great. If it makes us, I don't, we didn't start this venture as a way of thinking we were going to make money. It's always been, hey, we play this game and it's fun. Other people might like it. Let's put it out there. Yeah. You know, obviously we saw the success that Critical Role and Realm Smith and all these other guys have had. And, you know, we would love to do that, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, if I could play D&D as my job, mm-hmm. that would be awesome. Yeah. But the end goal at the end of the day is just to provide this for other people. It's not for them to provide to us. So that, yeah. that's what it is to me, you know. Yeah, we're just some dudes chilling, playing D&D and having a good time and hope that the viewers have a good time. Yeah. Right. Just, yeah. just want to share with them. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Hunter. For your time. You're so well. Thanks for the interview. Thanks for letting the audience get to know you. And by extension, Violet. Yes, Violet. Uh, you can catch more of Violet, Hunter, and myself, Evan, and Robert on uh, Chaotic Cast. Chaotic Cast. And the episode's premiere. Chaotic yes. Cast on uh, YouTube. Yes, Chaoticcast.tv. Give them on the Instagram. If Check you just want to go to our Instagram, there's a link tree to all of our other social media platforms and our YouTube page. So. Chaoticcast.tv. Click them all. Reddit. Twitch, maybe. There is a Reddit. Yeah, we'll have us. Hopefully, we'll get enough people to have a subreddit soon. Yeah. But, uh, I'm posting Instagram stuff on there. You'll learn a little bit more about the characters, maybe. See a little bit of the art that Robert made. Oh, yeah. Amazing art. I mean, just so much, so much prep that's gone into it for everybody. And it's just, it's cool to start the journey. If you want to check it out, see how we, how we build upon it, you know? Yeah. Take this journey with us. Yes. So anyway, that, that'll do it for this interview. Thank you again, Hunter. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Yeah, no Hope problem. to see you again soon. Huh? <laughs> <laughs>